Good evening. I'm Helen Mirren, and you're watching Documentary Now, season 53. In 1983, German filmmaker Rainer Waltz set out into the punishing Ula Mountains of Russia with an uncompromising vision. But over the grueling months of filming, truth and fiction blurred, as did man and nature. Witness, soldier of illusion. Thank you all so much for doing this. Um, congratulations on season 53. Um, another fantastic year of doc documentary. Yeah. I'm curious with this one, like, I mean, Herzog is like such an obvious, I mean, he's such a distinctive figure to begin with that like he's almost like right on the verge of parody um, at times. And like every, I mean, every, like who's any everyone who's ever like watched one of his documentaries does like a half-assed uh Werner Herzog impression so going into this with Alexander Skarsgård like how did you like how did you sort of formulate that to do something that like wasn't just that this like do something like more sort of you know specific while still being recognizable I don't think I ever thought he would do just an impression. Oh yeah, no, I mean, I remember even the first day on set when it was like, okay, here we are and the camera's rolling and okay, go, you know, what does Rainer Waltz sound like? And it was definitely like not, I mean, it was just something that we didn't know what it was gonna sound like, but I don't think we were expecting him to do a Herzog impression. Wilderness with a camera and it is no longer a wilderness. Just something else. I think if anything, I think he was, he was doing, something that was just seemed kind of fun and silly. And there was a little bit of his father in it, you know, and his, um, yeah. And uh, it's funny, there's a little bit of, you can almost hear Rainer kind of seeping through in some of the scenes in succession when he's sort of being a little sillier. <laughs> <laughs> even, even Judas is in the room. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Okay. Want to just a Gojo one? Yeah, that's just a Gojo one. Yeah, that's, just right. Gojo one. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Yeah, I was glad that he and Nicholas Braun went on to some success after the documentary <laughs> now launched their careers. <laughs> Absolutely. August Deal, same thing, John. Like, who knew August Deal would be like the perfect Kinski? And maybe one of the best, uh, maybe the best performance by anyone in anything I've ever seen. I know. It's so incredible. Yeah, yeah. He has so much precision that I knew he would make it his own. and. I sort of knew he'd be way into it. I, I didn't know the amount of passion he would bring to it. And then honestly, August Deal, I mean, Kinski is so specific looking. So no one looks like him, but <laughs> but but you we wanted someone with like, you know, such a distinctive look. Fred, the moment you're there's a my favorite moment I think of this season is Fred being framed between uh August and uh, Alexander, and you're just like, you just, you look so dumb. <laughs> and it's I gotta just... say, Fred, like Alan Yaffa is written, I think, I think I wrote it a little funny, like you absolutely take it off the page. Like it became such a bigger, better character who, who, oh. who once I saw you, I was like, oh, of course, like the network presence has to be very uh, annoying and, and 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 funny and we need like a lot of it you know oh thanks for writing that oh please um, like you got you guys giving me photos of the area where it would be shot really added to the script as well because like i then i found out we had an abandoned mine <laughs> that's such, that's such a great bit in that episode too where you have this whole elaborate sequence where they're like drawing photos of how they're going to like set up the sitcom set in a mine and they're gonna like, you know, scale people up the walls and have them cram out. And then it just gets to the point where they're like, oh no, we can't do that. And then the idea is immediately abandoned and then you just yeah. go back and do something else. That's, as, that's a real direct lift from Cave of Forgotten Dreams. Mm -hmm. And what I think if we could take the time to really explain to Werner Herzog what documentary now is, I think he'd like it because he knows documentaries are fake and a big part yes. of his stance is that they are manipulation. But that's directly from this bizarre moment in Cave of Forgotten Dreams where one of the scientists says, if we're quiet, we can hear something. And then he looks right into the lens and goes, and maybe our own heartbeats. And perhaps we can even hear our own heartbeats. And maybe we can hear our own heartbeats.
We could build a jacuzzi set here. Uh, yeah, yeah, also... In 1994, a BBC film crew spent a year in Northern England chronicling the inner workings of a beauty salon where they discovered not just a place to get one's hair styled, but also a social club, a confessional and a sanctuary. This is Two Hairdressers in Bagleyport. I wanted to ask because it's been a few years since the last season and you've obviously all been like doing other many different other projects. Like what determines kind of when it's time to get the band back together and do another season? Like, is there a group chat? Is there a bat signal? Like what <laughs> gets the wheels turning? You know, I think the thing that actually got the show off the ground this season was literally Kate Blanchett. I mean, we had done an episode with Kate last season called Waiting for the Artist. And I mean, not surprisingly, she was pretty amazing in it. And we had such a great time with her. And then one day she rings us up and is like pitching us an episode. Uh, for whenever we decided to do the show again. And um, she pitches us this totally obscure BBC documentary called uh, Three Salons at the Seaside um, about these hairdressers in this little town in Blackpool, England. And uh, I, I mean, none of us had ever heard of it, but I think we figured, well, I mean, if Kate wants to do the show again, I guess we're doing the show again. <laughs> we better and I don't feel bad about that. I feel like that was a good instinct and I'm glad we did it. <laughs> Obviously, Kate Blanchett wants to do something like with you, that's great. Was there any sense of like, could you maybe pick something like a little more recognizable or? I don't know about recognizable, recognizable, but the original was just so charming. It was undeniable, but it was, it was a good one to do. And the look and feel you knew would be so much fun. The trickier thing was, I don't think we've ever been in a situation where there's so little story, right. nor does there need to be a story in the source material, but you wanted to have any sort of thread to just have uh, arc and so it was just coming up with that but it was also so charming and so sweet um I mean, fred you've worked with um kate sort of on the show before but you're you're playing sort of a almost like a sort of sitcom character in this like you're the postman who kind of like pops by regularly like how much did you i don't know see like what her process was like like getting into this character well, in, what was in the like? original there is a mailman like that or a postman and I really did. I mean, I got a dialect coach to do the Blackpool accent and everything just because I wanted to get it right. So, Some bills and a postcard from France for you. Oh, that'll be on, on a holiday. But there's also like this thing in England where there's just like a, it's really common for like older guys to have really long hair. <laughs> there <were> just so <laughs> many <laughs> older awesome. rockers and they're you know they work everywhere they're they're postmen and stuff and it's just like an accept <laughs> old men having very long hair is <laughs> yeah just a kind of you know it's just accepted that it's like <laughs> uh right, when i when you first stepped out on set with that hair i just died it was so <laughs> funny and so unexpected and i remember when we first started showing cuts <laughs> except you were like this is great um uh, so the choice with the hair and <laughs> then I remember we pulled up the frame from the real film and like the postman looked identical to Fred. Yeah. Oh, okay, wow. yeah, 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 fair enough. But that was it. I just wanted to make it as believable as possible. Okay, one of the most exciting things about watching that episode, and I remember Reese and Alex told me even before they started shooting, because they were all going to be local hires. I mean, pretty much outside of Fred, Harriet, and Kate. And they, I was like, are you finding good people? And they said, there's a hundred good choices. Like, it's almost a shame there aren't more speaking roles. Literally everyone who's come in. Yeah. yeah. There were all these, like, incredible older women who were, I mean, mostly over 80, I want to say. <laughs> they were all, like, the auditions were incredible. It was so hard to choose. We had a 97-year-old actress, you know, who had, uh, she had worked with Orson Welles. I mean, she, she's been acting since the Chamberlain administration. And so funny. I mean, it, it does give it like that incredible flavor too, where it's obviously like not, I mean, you're not like making a real documentary at that point, but you are, uh, I think you're like even shooting in like a real location from the original film, if I remember oh, yeah. correctly. Same, same exact place. Yeah, it was, it was one of the three salons is still a hair salon. We took it back, you know, to a more period look, but it was the exact same salon. And so you could just like look at a picture of like one of the frames and go, oh yeah, the, the camera was right here. Okay, yeah, let's do. And then they walk through the door. Okay, look at that shot. You know. But as Rena says, everyone who walks through that door can feel safe to cry here. 
If a dog is a man's best friend, what is a monkey? In 2020, filmmaker Benjamin Clay set out to find the answer and discovered far more than he bargained for. This is My Monkey Grifter. Well, going from that, which is to um, what I think is, and I, I mean this um, as a compliment, but the meanest, um, <laughs> My Monkey Grifter. So many people told me, like, you gotta see Octopus Teacher. It'll just change your life. And then I saw it and I just thought, this dude is, whatever's happening with this dude is so much more interesting than what's happening with that octopus. <laughs> yeah. Like, it is also fun to work out the internal logic of the documentary, like not being yeah. able to cheat. Like that certainly with Monkey Grifter was trying to remember, you can't make a documentary. You have to remember that the documentary filmmaker would be able to get that scene. The most exciting thing there was, um, and again, one of the most thrilling things about this show is casting. Jamie Dimitriou, who's just so great and staff is such a wonderful show. And we just sort of reached out and his, he immediately had a comprehension for what it was that we were trying to do. And he was amazing. He was absolutely incredible. And, but this was also, I was thinking about him and I was thinking about August Deal as well and how, how perfect he would be for it, you know? I will say Jamie said that to me, the greatest compliment you could play, which is this is such a British show. Like he couldn't believe this was, he goes, this feels like it's the American adaptation of a show that was already happened in England. Yeah. I began to wonder, does Lulu dream? And if so, does she dream about me? And, and if she dreams about me, am I a man or a hairless monkey? What does one do when one loses one's spark, one's oomph, one's joie de vivre? In the year 2000, cinema icon Ida Leos chronicled the search for her lost goosebumps in the classic French documentary, Trouver Frisson. I know that um, Lillian Rivera, who's the star of Trouver Frisson, had no idea who we were or what we were doing. She still doesn't know who we are, or what we're doing. I mean, it was not that she was out of it. She was super sharp, but she just was like, I, I know she, what, did, know, she did know Agnes Varda, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. She knew Agnes, <laughs> I think she knew Agnes Varda personally. Right. But didn't she guys, didn't she boss <laughs> you guys around a couple of times because you were trying to get her to do something she didn't think Agnes would do? Oh, cool. that was the whole, that was the whole experience. It's <laughs> yeah, amazing. Really? How old is I, didn't, Rivera? I didn't hear this after. Oh, she was great, but she was definitely like, she was in charge. She was like, Agnes wouldn't have done that. And you'd say it's, it's uh, an she extrapolation. Was actually, you know, it was interesting because she was both like, don't ask me to be Agnes because I am not Agnes. I am Lillian and I will do it my way. And then we would then ask her to do something. And she would say, that's ridiculous. Agnes would never do that. I'm not doing <laughs> Was the script for that episode, was that written in English and then translated into French? Was it written in French? Like, how did it? English and then translated into French. Je joue maintenant le rôle d'une détective curieuse, maladroite, en plus dans l'alcool. Je cherche des indices pour comprendre ce qui a tué mon frisson. That episode is, I, I think, maybe my favorite of the season or something. It just sort of epitomizes like the weird space that the show gets into sometimes where it's like, I mean, there's some very like, big sort of funny broad jokes in that but there's also like a real um sweetness to it and it ended up actually like premiering at the toronto film festival the week um matt and tamison wrote this and you i will admit to not having a a great uh appreciation of knowledge of agnes varda but reading it you knew they did and so you knew it was like oh this is pitch perfect this is not somebody who's only seen you know a clip of an Agnes Varda documentary. Sweet, it is such a funny thing to like do parodies of documentaries and so you're literally taking these stories that are about a thing that actually happened and you're like, hmm, I think we want it to happen this way now. <laughs> In a small Welsh village, two men enter a ring but instead of doing battle with their fists, they throw stones at each other. And actually, it's not a ring, it's a sheep pen. I give you the 1996 classic sports documentary, 
How They Threw Rocks. Okay, so the one episode I think we haven't talked about is um, How They Threw Rocks, which is sort of the, the uh, or Welsh showcase, but that's sort of our When We Were Kings um, <laughs> takeoff, I guess, except just with men being hit with rocks. Uh, did it just come from like that basic idea that it would be funny to like watch people throw rocks at each other? It was so much funnier than I thought it would be. It was wanting to write an episode that it was entirely Welsh. I will say the first cut, when they sent me, it made me laugh so hard the first time somebody got hit with a rock. Everything about it, like the sound effect, the way it looked, the way it bounced, it just was perfect. Oh! It was beyond my wildest dreams. <laughs> the, the, the hard restriction was you have to be Welsh if you're in this episode, you have to be <laughs> Welsh. And Reese Thomas, who's our partner in all of this, my, my partner director on it, who is Welsh, he was not backing down. He was not backing down off of this. He's quite proud of uh, how Welsh the cast turned out on that. And also, you know, how many uh, British titles we upped this season. I mean, uh, you know, obviously we started the show with Dame Helen Mirren, but this season we added Dame Harriet Walter, uh, Sir Jonathan Price, uh, Sir Tom Jones. I mean, you know, if we could just compete in the Emmys uh, based on, you know, titles of British nobility, uh, I think we might be okay. <laughs> yeah. Tristan also in this episode, I mean, he was so the real deal. And he would tell a story, you know, that his father was basically this character. His father was Ali. And his father was the guy who would be in the pubs, standing on the table, you know, pint after pint, quoting Yates and like, you know, doing long soliloquies of just straight, like, hard poetry. And when he came in to do his his scenes, like, he brought so much like unscripted, like poetry. They thought he was burnt out and past it. They thought he was way too old. But this year, Lazarus, the people's champ, he was about to weave gold. Um, you guys have taken on so many movies by so many amazing filmmakers over the years. I mean, do you ever hear back from them? How do they respond to this? I'd say the best, um, the best example of of getting in touch with. Uh, the people involved was Spalding Gray's uh, wife, Kathy Russo, uh, got in touch with me after we did Parker Gale, Location is Everything. It was 10 degrees outside and the radiator pipes were clanging, bing, bing, like there were little Dutchmen inside them with hammers. And she gifted me, which I have framed in my home, uh, the full uh, map from swimming the kids. Cool. Ah, yeah. that's so and awesome. she sent she sent Bill one of Spalding's uh flannel shirts. Wow. There it is. But it's been amazing how much the documentary um community has responded to the show and and um you know has has been game to give us advice on how to make these episodes, you know, when we've reached out to them and asked like how did you do this? They're they oh god, this is exactly how we did it. You know, I think it's you know, maybe stems from documentary filmmakers and that that form of filmmaking is so hard. It is one of, it's got to be the hardest form of filmmaking and nobody ever asks. You know? <laughs> right. yeah. And like you, you realize what an all consuming passion project these films were because whenever we've asked these filmmakers or anyone that worked on the film, they have immediate recall. Yeah. Yeah, very They're specific. Like, no, no, that no, that we did not intend to get that. He walked up right after lunch, and they just immediately yeah. are on it with with why that shot is that way. Docs and Helen Mirren. That's it. Yes. <laughs> the best. Right, great seeing everybody. So far, always great so fun. To see you. To Thanks again, everybody. Sam. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thanks. Bye, Freddie. Bye, Alex. Now, more than ever, the world needs documentary now.